brave, intelligent, kind, loyal. Who am I describing? Well, I'm positive you've heard of her, but you might also think she's not really real. Yet to millions of people, her character is one of the most striking spirits you can come across in literature or film, and embodies real women everywhere. Her name is Hermione Granger, the female lead in the beloved Harry Potter series, written by J.K. Rowling. One of the things is you've got, I guess, the trio, Harry, Hermione, and Ron. And in that group, there's no sense that one of the group is superior to the other or different from the other. Like in, you know, you look at the Three Musketeers, they're all men. Or the Hardy Boys, they're all men. Or in Famous Pairs, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, Lone Ranger and Tonto. But here we have equal members of a group. Hermione, the female, is not the sidekick. In fact, it is she who often rescues Harry and Ron. That's Mimi Gladstein, author of the essay Feminism and Equal Opportunity, Hermione and the Women of Hogwarts. Gladstein is also a professor of English and literature at the University of Texas in El Paso, which makes her an honorary Harry Potter fan. We were curious if the power of Hermione Granger's character has led to any kind of shift in thinking in our culture. To help us answer that question, Gladstein traveled back in time to share her favorite female literary hero from her own childhood that came long before the Harry Potter series. When I was a young girl, which is a thousand years ago, I read the Oz books. And what I loved about the Oz books is that Dorothy is a main character, that the witches, Ozma of Oz and Glenda the Good, you know, there are a lot of important female characters in the Oz series. And so as I'm growing up and I'm reading these, I'm realizing, you know, I guess I internalized it. Women can do anything. Throughout history, there are examples of prominent female heroes. But for the millennial and Gen Z generations, what does a modern young woman like Hermione represent? Well, Amy Hogan, who's a media manager at MuggleNet, has some theories. MuggleNet is one of the largest online Harry Potter fan organizations in the U.S. Hogan's generation, who grew up with the release of the Harry Potter books, can resonate with the series in more ways than one. We're talking a lot about Hermione, which I think really encompasses what the feminist movement has turned into for millennials, especially. As a female, she's not afraid to be who she is. She recognizes that she's equal to everyone else. You know, she's not waiting around for someone else to solve the problem. She's out there ahead of it. And she views everybody as equal, not just wizards. There's the whole theme of SPEW and rights for house elves and other magical creatures that some wizards view as lesser. She's really kind of all about equality for everybody, which I think is a huge theme in my generation's view of feminism. But not everyone agrees with the benefits of reading the Harry Potter books. The element of sorcery has landed the novels on a multitude of banned book lists ever since their debut in 1997. In fact, just this fall, one Nashville Catholic school forbid the reading of the books in their library due to the use of spells in the text, according to CBS News. Hogan couldn't believe that in 2019, people were still banning these beloved stories from shelves. I guess I have an interesting view on this because I was homeschooled growing up, and a lot of my friends were not allowed to read Harry Potter because of witchcraft. <laughs> I always try to explain that these books, it's not preaching evil. They're not tearing apart the Bible. In fact, in some parts, you know, if you're looking for that symbolism, there is some theological and religious symbolism in there. And what sort of impact does banning the books have on young minds? I think that there's a lot of lessons that can be gained from these books, and it does make me sad that there are some kids out there who won't be exposed to that because of these conclusions that people jump to about the content before actually delving in and reading it and judging for themselves. The character Hermione gave Hogan an unbelievable gift that is more than just words on paper. 
It gave her a passage into literature that she had never seen before. As a kid, up until I read the Harry Potter books, I didn't really see myself reflected in a character. Most of the female characters I was reading about in young children's books and those like tween books, it seemed like they were all like the fairy tale princesses or just kind of the side characters. So it was kind of the first time I, as a young reader, saw a female character taking the lead and being more than just a sidekick. Um, I very much was a young Hermione when I was a kid. Um, bossy, but I embraced it <laughs> because it was okay. I think that for a lot of young girls who maybe aren't getting that support from their family and friends, that it's okay to be like that. It's okay to be outspoken and be in charge of yourself. Hermione is definitely not a sidekick, and neither is J.K. Rowling, the author herself. Gladstein said the creation of Hermione was actually partially autobiographical for Rowling. The obstacles the female heroine faced were sometimes all too real for Rowling. Gladstein reminded us of some of the detrimental stereotypes that come with being a female in a male-dominated world. One of the problems, let's say one of the problems that she dealt with early on, I mean, why is she known as J.K. Rowling and not her name? And that's part of the stereotyping that occurs in publishing. It's like they didn't think boys would want to read a series by a woman. And so uh, there is that certain amount of stereotyping in publishing. However, Rowling doesn't let being a woman seem too detrimental through the adventurous lives of her characters. One of the important things I love in the Harry Potter series is the way the women are part of the Kidditch teams. And the kids teams, they're talking about, you know, who's the catcher and who's making a goal, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't really realize until a few sentences later that these characters are female, you know. And you only get to realize that is when they use a pronoun, they say her this or her that. But not all women in the wizarding world are heroes. And for a literature buff like Gladstein, that's one of the beauties of the books. There's enough not just villainous males, but there's also villainous females. And I think one of the most, uh, Umbridge is one of the most horrible uh, villainous females. And so I'm happy to see, you know, those kinds of characters in literature too, not just, uh, you know, the strong male evil features. But Rowling has, you know, male and female characters across the moral spectrum. You've got incompetent men and incompetent women. You've got evil men and evil women. And you've got great young men and great female characters. It's, it's not just Hermione, but there's others. Since 1997, over 500 million copies of Harry Potter have been sold. The books in total have grossed more than $7.5 billion in sales. And J.K. Rowling's estimated net worth puts her on the short list of billionaires. J.K. Rowling is the wealthiest woman in uh, England. She's even wealthier than the Queen. So I guess we're not the only people that like the Harry Potter series. According to Hogan, the Harry Potter series and its magical life lessons are a slice of reality that's not going anywhere anytime soon. To find out more about our guests, Mimi Gladstein and Amy Hogan, visit viewpointsradio.org. This segment originally aired in December 2019 and was written by Annie Crawl. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. Studio production by Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week. New York Harbor, people have started in recent years to see whales that haven't been seen in that area close to the city in some cases, a century or more. The resurgence of wildlife in urban landscapes. Then, the only people who don't have regrets are five-year-olds, people with brain damage, and sociopaths. The rest of us have regrets. Understanding the gut-wrenching feeling of regret. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And 
that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Viewpoints.